Today, earlier, Philip showed you how, to, how you can write smart contracts in the ink language. Also, he drew your attention to some vulnerabilities. Uh, but, well, however careful you are during, during writing your contract, it is always a good idea to test it, actually. Uh, especially when you are planning to lock a like, few million dollars in your contract, you really, really want to ensure that it, its behavior is as expected and, and it does exactly what it should do and nothing more, nothing less. And therefore, I, I will shortly introduce, shortly introduce you to a few methods that can be employed, harnessed, uh, in order to verify contract behavior. And while there are actually a lot of approaches that we can take, uh, we can start with uh, static code analyzers, uh, some linting code, some, some, uh, some easy checks that, that are already used, uh, employed in the, for example, in the newest uh, ink compiler, I mean, in the newest ink release candidate version. Uh, for example, for some arithmetic overflows and, and some other stuff. Uh, there are also some companies, some projects that, uh, that are trying to implement uh, analyzers that will try to find uh, common vulnerability patterns in the contract, contract code. Uh, there are also a few, let's say, paradigms of testing. Code is unit testing, end-to-end -end testing, and uh, my own trademark, uh, what I like to call quasi-end-to-end -end testing. Uh, we'll be focusing on these three. But apart from them, there are also a lot of other, um, uh, not necessarily dedicated to contracts, uh, methods like fuzzing or stress testing and other stuff. However, as, as I said, uh, we'll be focusing only on these three, uh, three approaches, which are um, natively supported by ink language. Um, well, before we, before we uh, dive into Every, into every of these three uh, strategies, uh, it will be beneficial for us to understand the architecture of the, of the blockchain node and the, the environment where the, a contract is being executed. And for that, uh, for that uh, I usually use, uh, <laughs> uh, I use something like, that I like to call blockchain node onion. Uh, here's a funny image. Uh, okay, fun is fun, but uh, the actual keyword of this image is layer. Uh, we'll be in investigating layers of the blockchain technology stack. And by, uh, as, as you will see, uh, by analyzing, by investigating the, the architecture, uh, we'll, be, we'll, naturally derive, well, we'll naturally derive all these three methods. So let's start talking about how this onion looks like. Uh, well, when you run a validator, a miner, whatever, a, a blockchain node, uh, you usually run a main binary, some executable. This, exec this executable is usually called either a node or host, doesn't matter, here are the synonyms. And this binary has a few responsibilities. It is responsible for the very fundamental uh, operations like networking, so talking with other nodes, gossiping messages, sending transactions, I mean, interchanging transactions, blocks, and so other stuff. Uh, also, everything that, uh, that is connected with consensus, so block production, dissemination, finalization, it all happens here. Uh, also, this node usually is, uh, is connected, is uh, managing database, as well as all the off-chain ma maintenance, querying, indexing, whatever. Uh, so, for example, when you want to send some token transfer uh, on the blockchain, you literally will connect with this binary over some, uh, over some network and send a submit, you will submit a transaction exactly to this binary. Okay? Now, uh, from time to time, indeed, there is some new block or, to be more specific, a new transaction to be executed. And therefore, uh, such a host spawns uh, auxiliary auxiliary process, which we call formally state transition function. In the substrate of polka.world world system, it is called runtime. So I'll just use it interchangeably, either state transition function or runtime. And this binary, the second binary, second process, uh, has just, it is a single function actually. Uh, it, as an input, it takes a, the old state of the blockchain and a transaction. And the output of this function is the new state, the updated one. Uh, it's pretty simple in the definition, but it's actually the heart of the whole blockchain. Uh, 
So, well, every time node has to update its state by a transaction or a block, it will spawn uh, the nested environment, nested binary, uh, which represents this state transition function. However, in cases where the transaction to be processed is a smart contract call or smart contract instantiation, doesn't matter, uh, there's a, yet another layer, innermost layer. So when, we want, when the state transition function has to execute a contract in order to compute the new state, it will have to uh, execute the contract into a, uh, into a very uh, peculiar sandbox. Uh, here, a very isolated environment dedicated only for, this, for the contracts. So, for example, on the Ethereum, Ethereum blockchain, uh, this, this bubble, this innermost bubble will be just uh, Ethereum virtual machine dedicated for smart contracts. Okay, and uh, since, well, uh, this is almost a, an onion, uh, if, you, if you were to uh, uncover more layers that are here, uh, this, uh, this picture would look like more, more onionish, uh, but anyway, there are layers. Uh, yes, layers. Uh, but if we were to flip this, uh, flip this image, like look from the other perspective, from another dim dimension, uh, we'll see this technology stack. Right at the bottom, we've got this node uh, node layer. The second one is the state transition function. Uh, in the on top, we've got this contract execution environment, and. Uh, just to remind you, we are interested in testing contracts. So there are actually three possibilities, three segments, three partitions, of, well, no question, three suffixes of the stack that uh, actually might be interesting for us. Uh, firstly, we might be in interested only in the top level, uh, in this uh, innermost uh, bubble. Uh, and if we were to test contracts just within this part of the stack, we'll end, we'll end up with unit testing. Okay. Uh, on the other side of spectrum, uh, if you want to test the whole technology stack from the very bottom to the very top, uh, this is what is called usually end-to-end -end testing, right? From the end to the end. Now, the, the last possibility, which is here pretty natural, but it wasn't obvious for, for a long time, was to, ch was to uh, test contracts without this layer, testing just to uh, to this, these two innermost layers, uh, so only state transition function and this contract sandbox, and uh, this doesn't have a formal name. Uh, name quasi end to end testing is only my uh, my idea, uh, and I will use it till till the end of the lecture. Uh, and this will be the last. Uh, and okay, we'll be investigating all these approaches in in the in the order that I just showed you. There was a question. Yes, please. Is it the state transition function which happens inside the contract, uh, the contract execution environment? Really? Uh, technically, a state transition function, uh, uh, okay. Uh, technically, it's like state transition function has uh, some fixed uh, fixed API, like token transfer, vesting, staking, etc. Et and execution of this public API, this fixed API, is happening here. But say, uh, say transition function also has, like, let's say, a single method execute a contract. And implementation of this cannot be baked into here because contracts are a custom code. So we have to execute this custom code, this contract, somewhere else. And we have to outsource it to an isolated environment so that it is, well... Uh, so the state transition function is everything that we So the state transition function is everything that the the uh, the blockchain itself supports. Like uh, yes, exactly. Uh, another way to state transition, state transition function is just a API of the blockchain. So all the they send, uh, they receive the, the these things. Uh, send send tokens, stake, yeah. and so on. Thank you. Yes, please. Hmm? Uh, maybe uh, let's take my mic. So can we call it as a extrinsic function which is there in the runtime which we write? Sorry? Extrinsic functions. Extrinsic? Yeah. Uh, okay. The state transition functions are... Extrinsic function is exactly uh, one of the methods of the public API of the state transition function. Extrinsics are just functions that, are, that, that you can call here. For example, call, calling a contract is uh, an extrinsic. 
Okay, it's a part of this state transition. State transition function is actually a, a, a union of, uh, of the small extrinsics, right? So, so actually, state transition function is, is a sum of a f function, to, 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 uh, transfer tokens, stake, call a contract, and so on. So, so when a contract is interactive with a subset chain, right? So that contract is calling a extrinsic functions or, or what? No, API? no. So API it, is... State transition function exposes a single extrinsic call a contract, mm -hmm. okay? And now uh, we can call it, and if you are calling a particular contact, then uh, the state transition function will spawn uh, this sandbox environment and will take an uh, appropriate contract from its storage and execute, execute it. So, so, so what I understand that, uh, suppose I take an example, uh, so in, in the runtime, I, I wrote a execution function where we transfer, uh, say, some balance from A to B, and that A to B, that execution function is API. Now, uh, I wrote a, somebody else wrote a, you know, a smart contract to call that particular transfer function from that smart contract, and uh, can that... Oh, you are asking if, uh, if, the, yeah. if there can be uh, the reverse? Not reverse, like, you know, accessing the extrinsic function as an API inside the smart contract. Uh, sorry? Accessing the uh, extrinsic function as an API inside the smart contract. Uh, so, accessing uh, state transition function from... Uh, Con oh, yes, yeah. this is possible, and this is uh, this will be covered during the next lecture. Okay? Now we are... I was saying about this direction, but uh, reverse direction like the contract calling a state transition function is also possible, but we'll leave it to the next lecture, okay? Thank you. Okay, so uh, these are these three approaches that we'll be talking about, and as you can see, they are pretty natural, uh, they, they can be pretty naturally um, derived after just investigating this technology stack of the blockchain. Uh, now, uh, j j just uh, for a, like a case study for all, all of these uh, approaches, we'll take a look at the game, it says so. Uh, assume that there is uh, there is on, on a blockchain there is a game uh, round based, so that we have uh, some grid to be colored, and users uh, in every round, every user can try to color one of the one of the points on this grid. Okay, uh, whoever colors most uh, the most number of uh, points or cells uh, is a winner. Okay, uh, this logic is not that uh, important. Uh, we'll be ac actually uh, focusing on the player strategy. So an example here, uh, maybe not this one. Uh, for, for example, here let's say uh, our my player for this for this game uh, will have j will store only the dimension of this grid that is to be colored and one uh, one integer this next turn, and uh, in every turn my contract will be called. And it, uh, it is supposed to return uh, which, which point of this grid should be colored, okay? What, what I, which cell I want to color. Uh, and as you can see, this logic is not very uh, exciting. I will just increment this, uh, this counter and translate it into a, into a cell coordinates, okay? Uh, this is pretty trivial strategy. Uh, but to make things more exciting, I have prepared two more players. Uh, the next one <coughs> is a corner player, which actually, uh, as, as stated in the documentation, he will try to uh, color all the cells starting from the bottom right corner, and will, he will just start going uh, in the direction of the top level corner. And the third player is just a random one. So. Uh, during his turn, he will just uh, he will take from some some source uh, a random number. He will convert it to uh, coordinates, and he will try to paint uh, this zone. Okay. So uh, our case study will be we we, we want to uh, we want to test our player. This contract is my player here. Uh, we want to test whether it returns uh, whether you want to whether it returns valid coordinates, not, not outside uh, the grid. And also, we'll, we will, uh, our intention is to write some simulation. Uh, how, does, uh, how does our player uh, compete against other strategies, okay? Uh, we will start with uh, 
unit testing. And uh, you can think about unit tests uh, just like a classic component testing from classical, cl classic software engineering. Uh, what I mean by component testing, well, if you take a look at the contract code, it is nothing more than a module with a, some class, some struct, uh, which has a public API, public methods. Public methods new, a constructor and a public function my turn. Right, so unit testing, just to remind you, uh, in unit testing we have access only to this contract execution environment. So in particular, we do not have any access to state, to the blockchain state or other contracts, nothing. We have access only to this module that we have written. So what can we do with, uh, with, within this sandbox? Uh, well, let me see. Uh, maybe firstly here. Uh, so unit tests so, uh, will be usually very short. Uh, we write them using this ink uh, test macro. Uh, this, has to, uh, this has this impact that it will just prepare some, uh, uh, because well, uh, this, this module here uh, is not a, like a row, a clean uh, Rust module, so this, oh, sorry, uh, this macro will just prepare it for us just to, 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 to be able to interact it uh, pretty easily. Uh, and have, uh, and have, um, example test, for example, will just test our player on, the, uh, on a simple 4x4 four four grid. Uh, we'll cre we create a new instance of our contract just by calling a public API of our component. And then uh, during 16, 16 rounds, uh, we ask we ask our contract for for a new coordinate just by this my turn is a message this public public function our contract and we investigate that indeed the the coordinates that are returned are are, are as expected okay so there's actually nothing uh, nothing hard here uh, um, I have a question <clears throat> is is this actually relying on anything beyond it? is it is this uh, ink test macro uh, giving it any capabilities beyond just being a unit test? Like Very good question. This is next slide. Uh, okay, a few next slides. Uh, so a, a, more, uh, a more complicated unit test that, that uses possibilities from, from this macro uh, gives us, for example, uh, access to events. Okay, so events actually are happening behind the scenes. So indeed, this, mac this macro will prepare some kind of option environment for, for, for these tests. Uh, just to show you, yes. Uh, so within unit tests, we can only check this public methods just by calling Rust code. So we can check whether after, uh, after calling a constructor, all the fields are uh, initi initiated uh, properly. And we can just check this uh, these coordinates that are, that we are returning for a different uh, for a different grid size, grid, grid dimensions. Okay, uh, this is usual, uh, this is not uh, this will, surely this will not cover all the possibilities or the or the scenarios that our contract c could fail, uh, but still it is a pretty fast and uh, useful way for che for checking uh, the, the basic uh, basic behavior of our contract. Uh, now the more serious stuff, end-to-end -end tests. Uh, so as you can expect, end-to-end uh, -end tests uh, will perform a full flow execution from the bottom to the top, right? What does it mean? Uh, well, it means that we actually, for, for, to, to perform an end-to-end -end test, we have to have a blockchain, right? So for example, let's see here. Uh, for this, we'll use ink underscore end-to-end -end tests macro, and this macro does a lot of work. Uh, in particular, every time, every function that has this macro, uh, uh, there will be a new uh, mm, background blockchain uh, spawned in the back. There will be a background blockchain spawned, uh, especially for this function. 
uh, will get this client object, which is able to talk to, to, to this process, to this background process. And well, since we want to simulate a full flow, every interaction with our contract has to be made by sending a transaction, actual transaction. So if, 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 we, are, if we want to check uh, how constructor, uh, constru our constructor works, we firstly have to prepare uh, Trans transaction object, this will be this constructor. Uh, this will be actually a call data that we can put to a standard blockchain transaction. And then we ask our client to send it, no, to prepare a blockchain transaction uh, with, with this caller, with this call data, uh, probably with some other uh, call, uh, call arguments, will submit, uh, meaning will literally send, they say, send bytes to this background process. Then we will asynchronously wait for the answer. And then after all this time, uh, we can well, expect uh, success. A uh, similar flow is uh, for, checking, uh, for checking just the coordinates that our contract returns. So first we, want to, we have to instantiate. it. Uh, I just put the, the above code into a helper function. Uh, and for calling, I mean, for every interaction with our contract, we have to perform the same, uh, the same operation. Uh, so we, we, want, we have to prepare we call transaction data, prepare some uh, transaction arguments, have a <coughs> caller that, that has enough balance to, to cover fees, and then we have to submit to uh, this background process, asynchronously wait, and so on and so on. Uh, this is, well, we cannot avoid, this is exactly what we want to test. Uh, however, thanks to this full stack that, that is actually uh, going on, uh, we have much more power than in unit testing. So for example, we can uh, test our contract against, I mean, in the game. So we can pass another argument to this macro saying that, okay, there is one more contract that I want to compile and test against, so I'm just passing a, uh, a path to a manifest of the game contract. And now, uh, in the body of this test, I will instantiate two contracts, my player and the game. Then I will, then I will register this player here, start the game, and for every round, I will, I, I will ask for the coordinates, and in the end, I will ensure, oh, I, I will just, uh, try to end the game, ch 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 checking that everything went fine, there is uh, a single winner, and so on. Uh, we can go further in this madness, we can uh, check our, our contract, our s strategy against other, other actors, so we just throw uh, other manifest files, uh, and well, we can see here uh, just an analogous scenario, but here we, we are instantiating more players. All, all, all the three players that will be registered, and after some time, after playing uh, enough rounds, uh, we can uh, actually check what's the state of the game after, after it has been finished, and check that indeed the state of the game is finished. However, because one of the, one of the uh, players is random, we cannot be sure who has won, but we, we can ensure that somebody has won, okay? Uh, so yes, this is how we can uh, test our contract in the, well, in the environment, in the true environment. However, there are problems with it. Uh, the first one is this, That's, that everything happens asynchronously. So every, every interaction has to be uh, wrapped into a transaction, it has to be prepared as bytes sent to this process, which has to be uh, then processed by the node, a block has to be created, built, <laughs> finalized, executed, everything, uh, and after, the, after all, the, uh, all that stuff, uh, the result has to be uh, sent back to our client here. And the problem is that uh, if you want to check, if you want to test your contract against, your, against a particular chain, some network, uh, which has, for example, a block time of six seconds, like Rococo or Kusama, then every wait is six seconds. So 
in order to simulate your uh, DEX or your some, some contract, how it behaves over one month period, it will take you one month. Uh, that's long, but well, like re realized simulation, right? Uh, there are also other problems, more technical ones. So, uh, because we have to spawn a blockchain behind the scenes for every every test case, uh, this is somehow in some cases problematic. For example, if you if your node is running some Docker, there will be there might be some networking problems. Uh, sometimes setuping things is is a is a challenge, uh, and well. There are more problems. Let's go back to the slides. Uh, I've done a few end-to-end -end tests of, no, no, not necessarily contracts, but well, of the blockchain itself, and I tried to list all the all the steps in this pipeline uh, that I I spent at least few hours debugging. Is this? Uh, so there are a lot of places uh, <coughs> where something can go wrong, uh, but okay. This is exactly the purpose of end-to-end -end testing, to detect all these things, to debug them, to get some experience, and well, prepare the, the testing environment to, to be working. Uh, the thing is that here during this presentation, we are interested in testing contracts, just contracts. And many of this, uh, okay. And during testing contracts, we are interested only in three of these steps, actually, because all other are generic and shouldn't matter. Uh, Oh, okay, traps. Yes, there are traps, <laughs> and there is fear. Uh, there is fear again, but uh, there are three uh, three steps that we are interested in. So, firstly, uh, we want to prepare this data, prepare the interaction that that we want to perform. The second one is execution itself. So, the thing that actually happens on the on the runtime, on the contract execution environment side, and after this execution, we want to check the state. Right, so just to shorten the list, here are the three things that we are interested in, given when then. Okay? And now the funny thing is that uh, some of these steps happen on the node side, but we are interested in neither of them. Uh, so after a few hours of thinking, uh, I came to a conclusion that, well, to test contracts, it is usually nice to just be blind for this node layer. And let's let's test contracts just by interacting directly with state transition function and the uh, uh, and the contract sandbox, skipping this this bottom layer. Okay, so just taking the top of this stack, technology stack. And uh, this is why it's called quasi end-to-end -end testing because in some okay, it's not full end-to-end, -end, but it tests rather everything that should be tested during contract, te contract uh, tests. And this is how uh, a library called Drink has been born. Uh, it has like six months now. Uh, it is still immature, but it's uh, it, it can already do some pretty, pretty useful stuff. We'll see in a, in a minute. Uh, how does a Drink test look like? Well, we use yet another macro drink test, uh, and please uh, notice that this test case is completely <coughs> synchronous. There, there will be no await here. Why? Because all the stack, I mean, the state transition function, the blockchain state, uh, is kept in memory. So there is no background process, no node running in the background. Everything is done here in memory. So every contract interaction is done synchronously, immediately, instantly. Uh, so the flow is, as you, you might expect, we, what, uh, okay, this contract bundle is uh, like contract metadata, we can ignore it for now. Uh, so the first thing that we, that we do in drink testing, we prepare our, our environment, meaning this two, uh, two layers of the stack, so the state transition function with its state, uh, this is called session. Uh, this minimal runtime is just, uh, a minimal state transition function that is able to run contracts. And this session actually is our client. So something that we can interact with and interact contracts via. So first we can deploy a contract with uh, just by saying which construct or which method we want to use and passing some uh, passing 
arguments, uh, please uh, notice that what we do here is actually sending some, some transaction to the state transition function. So there are also some other uh, arguments that we can send, like sold to, for, for account deriving, or some money for payable, uh, payable messages. And after the contract is instantiated, we can just interact with it. So if we deploy a flipper, we can flip it a few times, and then at the end, uh, ask the getter what's the, uh, what's the current value, and hopefully it will be false. Yeah. Uh, so this is how drink tests look like. Uh, let's see how, how does this uh, relate to our contracts. So, no, maybe not this file, but this file. Uh, okay, so with drink we can, of course, uh, test whatever we could with unit testing. So, instantiation. We prepare a session, we deploy the contract, and that's all. It, it should just succeed. Uh, we can check uh, what coordinates are returned just by after instantiation of my, my player, I can call my turn and ensure that what, what I've got is are these coordinates, one zero. Uh, but still, we've got all the power that end-to-end -end testing has. So that's, uh, it's pretty easy to simulate a game with other contracts. Uh, so here, for example, we firstly deploy all the players, uh, my player, random player, corner player, a game contract here. Uh, all these contracts are, uh, are instantiated in our local in-memory uh, state transition function. Uh, after that, we register, this, uh, uh, register them in the game, simulate the game, and check whether it has finished. Right? Uh, the thing is here that it's immediate. We do not have to wait for any block to be built. Uh, if you want uh, a block number to be increased because, for example, there, are, there can be no, for, for example, uh, every round must, uh, every subsequent round must, must be performed in the next block, we can just ask our session to uh, build block instantly. So just, we are saying here, okay, so wrap all the transactions so far in a one block and just open another one, okay? Uh, there is no block time, it's ha it, it happens immediately. Uh, Okay, uh, this in a moment. Okay, uh, the thing is here that since end-to-end -end testing and this quasi-end-to-end -end testing has very similar expression power, uh, it seems pretty, it, it would be pretty weird to have to write both of them since uh, especially that the body of, the, of, the, of these test functions are pretty similar, right? So what we have done recently, and it's available in the Inc. 5, uh, is the possibility of switching these strategies. So the intention is that you can prepare a single test case body. So for example, this uh, ch ch checking whether our contract returns uh, uh, a, pro uh, a correct uh, coordinates. We write a generic code that uses some client either the drink one or the, or the true one that talks with the background uh, blockchain. So here's a, j just a one code that, that can be, uh, that, that checks this uh, logic. And depending on the use case, for example, whether we are in our pipelines, CI, CD pipelines, or whether we are developing things locally, uh, we can just choose what backend what strategy we want to check, uh, we want to use. So if you, are, if you want to go with the standard blo background blockchain approach, we use this macro ink to ink end-to-end -end test, but if you want to make things much faster, uh, we just pass this argument that we want to uh, use this runtime only backend. And this will actually run the drink behind the scenes. Um, right, so what drink can also do is, uh, uh, okay. Uh, drink has. Oh, sorry for light theme. Okay. Uh, what we have here also 
uh, is mocking. So thanks to that, we, we've got a sandbox environment in memory, and which that is not wrapped in all the node and layers. Uh, we can do things like mocking contracts. Uh, we can also do some code tracing, uh, mock chain extensions. Uh, these are pretty advanced uh, topics, but still they are extremely useful uh, when, we want, when you want to test your contract suits. Uh, what is more, there is a very primitive CLI uh, to interact with, uh, to locally play with your contracts. Uh, it's still in the development, but it, it works actually. So during this short demo, uh, you can see that oh, uh, we can, sorry, uh, we will what? We'll try to build contract locally. Uh, we can deploy it uh, to our local in-memory uh, state. Uh, we can interact just by calling uh, appropriate message. I mean, the, the API of the contract uh, get some get some results. Uh, we can also uh, we can also deploy other contracts from local local directories and interact with it. We can also switch between deployed contracts. Uh, yes. Uh, usually, uh, it it is a good idea to start development with with it. So just you, you get a pretty fast, pretty handful, uh, pretty pretty useful, helpful uh, CLI to, to to just check whether your contract, at least at, the, at this basic level, works like expected. Uh, now going back to the presentation. Yes, uh, time for takeaways. Uh, so. The, the most important thing is that you should always test your contracts, no matter what. Uh, and uh, some heuristics which approach you should, took, you should take is that these unit tests, which are extremely fast to write but are extremely primitive, are good for the very, very early phase and for complex methods. So sometimes your contract will have uh, advanced economic um, computations in some method, uh, some non-trivial, uh, non non-trivial logic there, and usually it is it is okay to to cover this uh, these complex methods with just unit testing because you, in that case you, you normally do not need any nothing more other contracts or uh, any other part of the stack. Uh, this quasi end-to-end -end testing approach is pretty good for fast uh, development uh, process. So. If you, if, you, if, if you want to test your contract locally, not, you do not want to wait for the block time and so on, uh, this is a pretty good choice. And the second uh, use case is long-running simulations, right? So uh, to avoid waiting for a month to perform a simulation, to perform some predictions over a month, uh, you can just, uh, you can just uh, avoid uh, the whole block time, the node layer, and to work just within memory it will take literally seconds. Um, however, this end-to-end -end suit is, I think, you should never give up. Uh, usually, they, it, is, it, is, uh, it is normal to develop it in the end of the process, just be, be before release. But uh, it is actually necessary to test your conduct to verify how it behaves in the actual target environment without any mocking, about, uh, uh, without any hacking like, like this quasi end-to-end, -end, uh, just to ensure that uh, your contract works as expected in the expected environment. And uh, this is the last slide. Are there any questions to that slide? No? Okay. Oh, there it is. Hello, Sukmit here. Now, can this sweet drink or unit test help me test the front runners or the bots or like? Is my transaction safe? Like, what do you mean safe? Like, you know, um, I think the bug was they were transferring first and then sending, then then updating the balance. Something like that could be tested here. Or reentrant re attacks, like reentrant attacks. Yes, yes. I mean, uh, this quasi this drink thing uh, will will just simulate the whole the the normal flow but without wrapping everything into transactions. So yes, you, you, you are, 
uh, it is uh, you, you will test exactly the same things as with the end-to-end, -end, being the reentrance here attacks and so on. So yes, yes. <laughs>